Uh, so the roadmap for the next uh, couple of weeks is um, I'm going to talk about three different bandit problems today. One is uh, adversarial bandit, the other one is contextual bandit, and then the third one is bandit with experts. Okay, so these three are sort of three completely different frameworks for, uh, well, not completely different, but they are sort of related to uh, the general bandit problem that we have been talking about. Um, and then we will talk about exploration schemes in multi-arm bandit. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on different exploration schemes in the next week that people have considered in the context of multi-arm bandit. Um, and unfortunately, the literature in this particular area is quite scattered. So there is one algorithm studied here. There's another algorithm proposed there. There is third algorithm uh, proposed in some other conference. So this is going to be an overview of what people have thought, what people have talked about in the last three or four years about exploration schemes in bandit. So this is like a brand new topic. Uh, there's no survey paper that I can refer to. So, uh, so bear with me while I talk about maybe five, six, or seven different types of exploration schemes uh, they, that are not coherent with each other. So it's not like it follows a good narrative. It's all going to be scattered all over the place. So that's going to be next week. And then I'm going to talk about how to incorporate exploration within the context of MDPs. So, so far, all the bandit algorithms that we have talked about, the state is IID or the state doesn't exist and all you see is reward. And then based on the reward, you have to figure out what you should play. Uh, so what happens if there is a state? Okay, so now it becomes a regular reinforcement learning problem that we have been talking about in the context of MDPs. And then we'll talk about UCRL algorithm, which implements UCB type exploration schemes to general MDPs, with, which has a state and the state is Markovian and things like that. So we'll talk about that, and then we will move on to continuous state, continuous action, MDPs, and we'll talk about universal function approximators and how you can use that in the context of continuous state, continuous action, MDPs. So as far as the applicability goes, or application to industrial problem goes, what we are going to talk about today has uh, seen a lot of applications in industry, and the reason for that will be very clear. Uh, pretty soon. And then the continuous state, continuous action MDP is the one that has created a lot of buzz uh, in the past uh, 10 or so years uh, because of the use of deep neural networks as function approximators. But we'll see that that's not the only function approximator and there is a lot of stuff that you can do uh, in the context of continuous state, continuous action MDPs. Okay, so today's topic is adversarial bandit and contextual bandit. <coughs> okay, so one of the issues with stochastic bandit that we had been talking about, so UCB algorithm was an algorithm for solving stochastic bandit. Uh, so the problem with stochastic bandit is that you expect the reward to come from a distribution. So what if the reward is not coming from a distribution? It's still independent uh, in the sense that the reward that ha you have seen in the past doesn't really affect the rewards that you will see in the future, but they are not coming from any specific distribution. Okay, so that's the reason to study adversarial bandit. So the setting is adversary fixed reward xt in 0, 1 raised to n. So you have n arms, and so each, uh, an adversary picks a reward uh, zero, between 0 and 1 for every arm. Now, of course, I'm saying adversary, but it doesn't really mean that the adversary is picking a reward that is really bad or really, like otherwise adversary can pick 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So it's not useful if adversary wants to be really adversarial. So it's not really an adversarial adversary, it's just an adversary which picks a reward according to his or her wishes or fancies, okay? 
agent, so this is the learning algorithm, agent picks a policy of course, mu t, that maps information to delta n, which is the distribution, or let me write it as pt, which is a simplex in Rn. So simplex is the set of all probability distributions over 1 to n. Oh, let me just write it. Delta n is equal to p such that p greater than or equal to 0. Summation of pi is equal to 1. i goes from 1 to n. So set of all probability distributions uh, over n objects. So as you can see, the reward is not coming from any distribution here. It's just something picked arbitrarily between 0, 1 raised to n. Um, now the way agent acts, so agent has picked the probability distribution over its action, which is pulling one of the n arms. So agent uh, acts, agent uh, picks, well agent cannot pick, but agent simulates. ut which is picked according to distribution pt and observes the reward xt ut. So the utth component of xt. What should be a notion of regret for this problem? So there is no distribution over xt. So what, how should we define regret? What would you do if there is no distribution of the reward that you are seeing? But you know that at the end of one year or two years or five years, you will observe certain rewards from the adversary. Okay, so remember the adversary is picking all n dimension, but you are only observing one point in that n dimensional object. Uh, and the reason is because you have picked that particular arm simulated according to the distribution PT, which specifies, which is specified through your policy and all the information you have seen so far. So here is the regret that people have thought about. This is max over i summation of x t i t equals 1 to capital T minus expectation summation t equals 1 to capital T x t u t. This is sometimes referred to as weak regret. So what is this regret trying to minimize? So if you had the option of knowing all the rewards that you will see in the future for all possible arms, you could have picked one arm and just played that arm all the time. Okay, so then this is what you are going to, this is what you can achieve 
uh, the best reward that you could have achieved from picking just one arm all the time. But instead, you pick different arms across time because you didn't know what the reward sequence is going to be. And so this is the reward that you are expecting to get. Now, the expectation is because you are picking your actions randomly. Okay, So the expectation is over the actions that you're going to pick. And so this is what you actually got. So this is the best you could have achieved if you had the option of picking the same arm all the time. And this is what you have achieved because of the choice of your um, strategy. And so that's why it's called weak regret, because you cannot adapt your arms according to the rewards that you will be seeing in the future. It has to be the same arm that you will play throughout the horizon. That's why it's called weak regret. And let me rewrite it as these are all equivalent expressions, so don't think that they are different. I'm just writing it because it's so this is useful for the assignment, assignment three, this expression, just so you know. So that's the problem. Any questions on this problem? Yes. So we're effectively choosing to compare it to the best average arm. Yes. Is there a reason we don't automatically switch to formulating it as a function of average regret, and it's just uh, unbounded if we run it in the limit? Average regret. Uh, so the, the notion of regret has been designed so you can, you can study the transient behavior. So how much money have you lost or have you paid in order to get the best performance in the first capital T time steps? So why do you want to study average regret? So in averaging, when you do averaging, you kind of lose track of how much money you have paid in terms of exploration or how much loss you have incurred because you were spending time exploring and looking at other things than what is the best possible arm. Okay, the reason and I was asking about it was because we're automatically picking the best arm to compare it to based off the average overall. So it was, does it gain us anything to switch notionally into already thinking of the average regret since we're thinking of the best arm on average compared to? I think the two notions are same because for average, I just have to divide it over one over t, right? So, it's so it, it, there's nothing it gains us. Yeah, in, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. So if we know all the, info, all the reward information, why don't we put, uh, give the maximum reward every time? Yeah, so then the, you then the problem is not meaningful. You, you mean so um, maybe, uh, maybe when I talk about contextual band, it will be clear why, why this notion is a good notion of regret. OK, so let's hold off that particular question for some time. But in the other, like if you think about it right now without knowing what contextual band it is, if I allow this max of i to go in, yeah. so for every time you pick the optimal arm, then of course this can be really high and there is nothing much you can do to minimize your regret because you're giving too much power to the person who knows everything that's going to happen in the future. Okay, so in some sense, you're limiting the power of this particular person who knows what's going to happen in the future. Okay. All right, so now the algorithm that we are going to talk about is exponential, it has a big name, exponential algorithm.
exponential weighting algorithm algorithm with exploration for exploration and exploitation. That's the algorithm. If you had to abbreviate this algorithm in your paper, what would you name it? <laughs> okay, one thing you should know, multi arm banded community is very good with coming up with new names. Okay, for every algorithm there is a name. So what would you name this algorithm? EQ, okay, you are close. Triple EXP. Sorry? Triple EXP. Well, yeah, you are, you are actually very close. So this is EXP3 algorithm. Okay. <laughs> so exponential, exploration, and exploitation. EXP3. So what's the algorithm? So what's the key idea? Well, uh, way the reward according to the probability of picking arms. Okay, so that's the key idea. Uh, in words, let me just uh, write it down. So I'm going to define x hat t u t as x t u t over p t u t x hat t uh, i equals to zero for i not equals to u t. What's the expected value of x hat t? So it's actually exactly equal to uh, x t u t. Okay. <clears throat> this is known as important sampling. Remember we talked about important sampling? Oh, importance weighted. Est expect, no, estimated reward. Uh, this, is a, this is some auxiliary random variable that you have defined, which will be used in the algorithm. Okay? So how do you define this auxiliary random variable? Well, this is the reward you have observed. This is the probability with which you have picked, you are planning to pick that particular arm. Right? So, so you want to weigh the reward, you want to weigh the reward according to the probability of picking the arm. Okay? So the, the weight, weight is 1 over the probability. And it just turns out that by defining it this way, you have this cool property that x hat t u t is actually equal to x t u t. algorithm with uh, all the options the adversary has uh, in front of it, 
I mean, theoretically, they could just be putting uh, all the weight on one arm and then randomly picking uh, which arm it's going to be at each time step. And right. you're never going to gain that information if they're picking some arbitrary strategy. So what are we actually expecting this algorithm to be able to achieve? Is it right, right. Yeah, good question. Yeah, go ahead. Be because as at this point, without much more severe constraints than what the adversary can do, you know, the adversary could always drive it to zero uh, in expectation. Right, so that's why I said the adversary is not truly adversarial. It's just that the rewards are not coming from a specific distribution. So I think, you know, the, I, I don't quite know why they call it adversarial bandit because adversary has a very specific connotation in the context of game theory where the adversary tries to minimize or maximize something. So in this particular situation or in this field, adversarial bandit doesn't necessarily mean that there is an adversary who is maximizing or minimizing something. It's just that the distribution, there is no underlying distribution on the reward structure. That's all it means. Okay, so. But e even with that, we have no way to guarantee that we'll get any reward at all. Oh, so what is the algorithm attempting to achieve? Right, so, the, so you always want a regret which is lower than, so you want regret which is less than equal to uh, t raised to something. So t raised to say 0 0.99. Because if it is less than t raised to 0 0.99, then the average regret will be equal to 0 as t goes to infinity. Okay. Right? So you, now in the case of a UCB algorithm, you wanted regret to be less than or equal to t raised to a for any a greater than zero. But if you're not in the situation where xt comes from a distribution, then you could be in a very bad situation. We just don't know. So that's why you want to get a regret which is less than or equal to t raised to something, which that something is uh, less than one. Okay, That's what we hope to achieve. That would be the ideal case. And of course, we will see that this particular algorithm would uh, achieve square root of t regret. So it's, it's a good algorithm. OK, so the algorithm comes from, uh, let me define another variable, s0i is summation of x hat t i, t equals o, oh, uh, s t i. Uh, I've used S, I need uh, tau. Can I use tau? I think I can, yeah, I can use tau. Tau equals one to T. Sorry, what, what were you saying? X hat tau. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. OK. So this uh, algorithm comes from, the f it was first divide, div devised in R et al. 2002. So this is not the same paper as we studied last time, but it's the same author. Uh, at least the first author is the same. And the result that I'm going to talk about comes from the Bandit algorithm book, which is posted on Carmen. This is a book by uh, Tol Atimore and uh, Saba Sepeshwari, page 152. So this algorithm designed in 2002 is slightly different. Uh, so that's why I'm picking a more modern reference so that uh, people have looked at it with a much more careful understanding of the algorithm. OK, so we want to come up with a policy. We want to come up with a policy, mu t, that uh, gives you good regret guarantee. 
So here is the way to generate the policy. So I need to know capital T. So I need to know when am I going to stop this whole process. And then I can define eta as, which is the learning rate. It is, where did I write it? Let me check what the value of eta is. Oh, yeah. Log n over n capital T. And then I mu t i t equals to p t, which is given by exponential eta s t i over, maybe I need to put t minus 1 here, exponential eta s t i over summation j equals 1 to n. it should be uh, t not t minus 1 there, otherwise we're going to be off by 1. No uh, one. Well, this is the policy at time t, telling you what to do at time oh, t, okay. but at time t you haven't really observed xt. Too many exp on the board. And the theorem is, which comes after a pretty long proof. Regret mu t is less than equal to 2 square root n log n into square root of t. Have we used such an exploration scheme before? Anyone remembers? In SARSA, we had a similar policy. Okay, so we see the same policy here. SARSA also the it was exponential of negative Q function multiplied by some parameter beta t, and then summation of exponential minus beta t and then Q t. That was the strategy in SARSA, okay? So we see the same thing here. Now the important thing is, in the case of UCB algorithm, you looked at the mean reward, and then you bumped it up by a factor, which accounts for the fact that you may not have sampled that um, enough number of times. So that was the case when the reward was coming from an IID uh, distribution. No. The reward was IID according to some specific distribution. Uh, in this particular situation, you see a different form of exploration scheme, which looks at the rewards or some function of rewards that you have seen so far, and that does an exponential weighting of that particular reward, okay, or aggregate reward that you have seen from that particular arm. Okay, so this is a second type of exploration scheme. And this scheme uh, makes 
exploration for every arm required. So for instance, PT is never equal to zero. So this is never equal to zero or any element of PT can never be equal to zero, which means that almost all arms will be picked at several points of time throughout this uh, decision process. So all actions will be picked throughout the decision process if you use this particular exploration scheme. Yeah. No, you are just simulating oh. UT from this PT and then using that particular action. Okay. So, yeah. Is it required to for the reward to have a stationary distribution or it could have like this one reward doesn't have any distribution. So it could be like non stationary distribution. Yeah, it's non stationary. It's the worst possible well not worst possible. In the worst possible there is an adversary doing some bad coming up with bad rewards but in this particular case the um, the adversary is not um, yeah so the reward is sort of fixed it's not coming from any distribution so I, I don't know whether you want to call it non-stationary or not because non-stationarity would mean that the distributions are changing over time yes. but but this is worse than that there is no notion of distribution here as far as the reward is concerned. The expectation is only because here because your UT is random. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so this, yeah. So, oh, I understand how uh, the fact that we're going to explore uh, is done by the softmax layer over or there'll be one that uh, continues to be the most likely or and we it continue to hit over and over again. Mm -hmm. and, but is it necessary that the other exploration arms, arms are governed by the same softmax strategy or could you have, have some exploration probability you were looking at that's defined by the difference and from um, the maximal arm and, and distribute that probability in a different and mm -hmm. way and mm -hmm. still get at a sub t linear regret. Good. So good question. So your question is can I use a different exploration scheme here mm -hmm. and get a sublinear regret? Yes, except for the maximal arm that's going right. to govern right. the top uh, the, I'm, I'm inclined to say yes, but the question is what kind of scheme would you use so that your proof is simple? Okay, so for instance, the proof of this particular theorem, you know, flows across three pages in the book, in this book, okay? And in the paper, of course, the exploration scheme is slightly more complicated, so the, it, adds a, it adds a uniform distribution. Um, so lambda this plus one minus lambda uniform. And based on that, it does some uh, regret bounding and that also is very complicated. So the more complicated you make the the exploration scheme, the more difficult the analysis of regret goes. Of course, you also have to think whether it can be implemented quickly enough or not because most of these algorithms have been designed keeping internet and you know Google AdWords kind of thing in mind. So it has to be calculated within microseconds if not milliseconds. Okay, so you can't really come up with the sophisticated exploration schemes. Now one, one problem I have with this particular algorithm is the fact that you need to know t in advance because your eta, which is the learning rate, it depends on capital T. Of course, n is easy to know, the number of arms you have, the number of choices you have is perhaps easy to know. But the fact that you need to know the end of the horizon is kind of difficult. So. So how do you extend it to the situation where you have a horizon length that is kind of, we don't know? Yeah. I have a question. So what are we exploring here? Uh, so you want to explore various options here and perhaps pick the one that's going to give you the best reward, right? So you, remember this is, you're trying to find the one arm that would have yielded the maximum reward over the entire time. Know 
the one that will give me maximum reward if the distribution may change from time to time. So the, the, mean, the mean of this distribution could change. Correct. Correct. So, how, so there's nothing to explore in this case. Well, exploration is not useful because the distribution may Sometimes the mean that I can get from one arm could be like very high. Right. In another time, it could be like zero. Right. So what am I exploring here? Well, so one thing you are doing is um, not acting according to a deterministic strategy. So you're always randomizing, yeah. right? And that randomization in expectation gives you a much better Reward, yeah. yeah. So as long as the non-stationarity is not dependent on how the actor, how the agent is learning, I think you should still be fine. Um, I mean, the uniform, the uniform distribution could also provide a good strategy. Well, yeah, but there the regret is going to be linear in T. So this, this constant would be something different and then you will have a linear regret. Let's uh, think about it at a later time, perhaps uh, offline, okay? It's a good question, but I just don't have a good answer to that question. Okay, yeah. So back to the idea of if we were trying to extend this to an indefinite horizon, yeah. and could we ha start with some arbitrary horizon as a function of of and so we're exploring enough in each time and then we could effectively uh, use that n for uh, sorry that t for uh, the first number of implementations mm -hmm. and then and double it again oh and good and yeah then, that's uh, exactly the the algorithm okay. so it's known as a doubling trick so that's that's the right algorithm uh, Okay, doubling trick. So the trick is as follows. You have an algorithm where you need to know the end of the horizon in order to run the algorithm and it gives you whatever regret bound it gives you. Uh, so, and you don't know what the end of the horizon is going to be in your case. So what you do is uh, you pick capital T to be whatever, 10 time steps or 15 time steps or 20 time steps, whatever, it doesn't matter. So you pick 10 time steps and then you run this algorithm for 10 time steps. And now let's say you want to go ahead and act some more or, or learn some more. Then what you do is you change the next t to be 100, so 10 square. Okay, and then you, no, uh, sorry, not 10 square, two, 2 multiplied by 10. Okay, so, so you, your first horizon length is t. The second horizon length is 2t. The third horizon length is 2 raised to 2t. 2 cube t, and so on. Okay, so every time you double the length of the horizon that you picked in the past. So what's effectively happening is that eta is changing with time. So eta is constant in one epoch, and in the second epoch, eta goes down by one over square root of two. In the third epoch, eta goes down by one over square root of two further, and so on and so forth. And this is known as a doubling trick, and that will give you a sublinear regret as well. So this is a way to expand an algorithm that takes into account the horizon length. You can expand it to an algorithm that doesn't require the horizon length in advance by using this doubling trick. However, of course, you can come up with a better algorithm. So doubling trick, of course, gives you some linear regret. But if you want to optimize the constant, you might be able to come up with other algorithms. Like there are other algorithms available, uh, which doesn't use doubling trick, but can it still achieve sublinear regret. We'll not study them in the class. But uh, you can refer to this particular book for more algorithms of this type. Any further question? Now let's go back to 
uh, the model for contextual bandit, and this is a big business now. Um, so contextual bandit was formalized back in 1979 in the context of uh, medical treatments. So remember when we were talking about bandit algorithms, I was uh, saying, oh, you have like people coming in and you want to administer drugs and you want to use the drugs that is most promising more number of times and drugs that are less promising fewer number of times, right? So that was the idea. Now I'm going to change the equation by saying that look, every person is different. So if you have a male of the age 20 coming in, you can perhaps give that person a different drug. And if you have a female of the age 30 coming in, then you can perhaps offer her a different drug. So what's the, so what, what, what has happened here? So there is a context. And whenever a person arrives, there is some context associated with that person. So in this case, it's the age and the male slash female. That's the context. And you can offer the recommendation based on the context, based on things that you can observe about that particular person. Now think about it in the context of advertising. Um, if you have signed up for, say, Amazon, then the Amazon would know, and then Amazon as a company or their algorithms would know what your name is, where you come from, your location, um, your age, your email address, and it can do some other deep search about you and can figure out what all things you like and dislike. And then you have gone through Amazon's uh, several times and you have clicked on some items, you have uh, purchased some items. So all of that builds a context for Amazon. And then Amazon can use that context. It knows all of that information. It can use that context to offer you personalized recommendation. And that particular, and how, what to recommend is something that is studied under the framework of contextual bandit. So let's, let's try and study what contextual bandit is. So adversary picks context CT, which lies in the set of context C, and XT01 raised to N. So your policy mu t takes into account the context and all the information that you have received so far and then maps it to p t.
Okay, so let's think about it. Amazon knows what things you have purchased, what's your age, what's your sex, what's your uh, likes and dislikes based on all the clicks you have done in the past. And uh, there is a reward, XT, associated with each recommendation that Amazon is going to offer to you. So of course, in the context of Amazon, or in the case of Amazon, N could be 100, 1 million. Okay, there are 1 million items that Amazon can sell. So it needs to figure out which ones should, should Amazon recommend to you when you go to the home page of Amazon. Or in the case of movies, CT is all the movies that you have seen, TV series that you have seen, what are the genre of those TV series that you have seen, which ones you have liked, which ones you have disliked, do you have an IMDB account, what all movies you have reviewed, what all movies you have not reviewed, and so on and so forth. So there's just a humongous amount of data that you have generated by clicking here and there. I know, I hope you know that. <laughs> and all of that has been logged, okay? And all of it is there in certain servers. So, so it knows all that data, and then it needs to map to what, which movie should Amazon recommend to you, okay? The more, the better movies, if Amazon recommends you good movies, then you will be uh, inclined to pay for Amazon Prime subscription and keep watching movies all the time, and your advisor will be very unhappy, uh, which I hope you don't do. Okay, now, the agent observes, so this is the learning agent, this is Amazon's algorithm. So the, the Amazon's algorithm observes the context and picks a probability distribution over this, uh, so PT is in delta N. Probability distribution over all possible uh, arms that uh, the agent has. And then the agent simulates UT, so it picks all the items that needs to be recommended according to the probability PT, and then observes the reward, which is which of the objects have you clicked or purchased, and which of the objects you have not clicked and not purchased. Okay, so that's the reward. What's the regret? Well, the regret is actually very similar to the adversarial regret. Expected value of summation C and C, max i in 1 to n, summation T such that Ct equals to C, XTI minus XTUT. So <clears throat> now let's assume for simplicity, the context is just uh, male, female, and the age of the person. So for every, so let's, let's fix the C value and look at this particular expression first. So let's say the context C is male of age 25, okay? So for all males of age 25, what is the object that I should recommend to that particular person so that I can maximize the reward? Now, of course, each person is going to like different items, okay? So this is all different for different people, but you would want for a specific context you want to maximize your reward that, or maximize the, so this, this part is the adversarial bandit regret, right? Bandit regret. So you want to minimize the regret of 
the best possible thing you could have uh, recommended to all males of age 30 to 25 minus what you actually did and the reward that you received through that, through your recommendation engine. Okay, yeah. Unless we have a distribution of that context. No, there is no distribution. Yes. Then why is it in the expectation itself? Well, it doesn't matter. You can take it out of the expectation. Okay. It's, it's completely fine. Yes. C that has to be finite, right? Uh, context set? Yeah. yeah, C has to be finite. Well, there, I'm sure there is some algorithm for infinite contextual bandit also. But for infinite, in this case, this expression will be, could be infinite. Oh, then there needs to be some distribution now over C then. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is finite at the moment. Okay, so C is, the context set is finite. So what will you do if you are faced with this situation? So you start some company and you develop a recommendation engine and you realize that there are many contexts, many, many, many contexts and you want to figure out what each person is going to like based on the context or the information that you have regarding that particular person. Yeah. In the absence of uh, information about how the context cross apply. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have any cross correlation right. and about the context. Right. It should just become a bunch of separable adversarial bandit problems. Perfect. That's exactly what it is. So you what you do is run adversarial bandit for each context. So you're getting people with different contexts at every point of time. You're keeping track of what you have recommended to every context, every male who is age twenty five. You're keeping track of every female who is of age thirty, right? So you're keeping track of all these uh, different recommendation that you have provided, what they have clicked, what they have not clicked, and what rewards you have received. So you basically run. This is this is like a no-brainer, no-brainer algorithm, which is run uh, adversarial bandit for each context. for each context. So let NCT, number of uh, people with context C until time capital T then the regret can be written as <coughs> n log n. This one? Is a P of P T. P a function of C of T, right? C of T as well as the, all the rewards that you have seen in the past. And all the recommendations that I you have. Yes, 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 yes. And this P T is in delta N. Okay. Okay. So one simple idea is to run an adversarial bandit for each context and the regret can be easily computed. It's the, uh, for each context, this is the constant, this is the regret term, right? Um, now of course you don't know how many 
people with contact C, you are going to see over the horizon length T, so you have to use the doubling trick in order to extend the adversarial bandit algorithm to algorithm with arbitrary horizon length. Okay? But that's not too difficult. Okay. So that's an easy algorithm or no-brainer algorithm, just use an adversarial bandit. Now you brought up an important point, which is what happens